And uh, the name of this talk is DC Flux and Moon Bouncer. And uh, here's uh, our agenda for this evening. And l let me, uh, it's great to be a winner and aren't we all? So uh, I'll start out a little bit uh, about myself. Yes, I was a teenage engineer, uh, started doing broadcast engineering in high school. Last year I did a talk called The Man with the Soldering Gun, but it was on Thursday. This is a picture of me living on the edge without a tower harness. And here's the obligatory picture of me sodomizing a cow. <laughs> and if you look closely, you'll notice he is shackled and cannot escape. I come from a small town, uh, Kingman, Arizona, which is 100 miles south of here. And uh, by golly, when I walked past this, I had to take a picture of it because this is the stupidity we have here. Not only did he try to lock it to the light post that all you'd have to do is lift it up, uh, he couldn't even fit the bike lock around his bike. So, yeah. So, the origins of this talk, I couldn't find a picture of this, so I had to use this. Uh, recently, I was without internet for about three days. The reason was what we call in the broadcast industry, backhoe fade. An illegal immigrant in one of Phoenix's many suburbs thought it would be a good idea to dig up a 150-foot section of 144-count fiber optic cable. Now get this, he was doing it because he wanted it for the copper. <laughs> so I figured, uh, hey, let's, you know, when the internet fails, we pretty much uh, want to come up with some clever way to communicate across the world, preferably. Uh, without the aid of it. Uh, so let's start out with... So uh, my talk will focus uh, a lot if you're an amateur radio operator and if you are not, uh, why not? Uh, hopefully this, I haven't gotten confirmation on it, but we will be giving amateur radio testing, hopefully. Uh, usually we do that Sundays at 12 o'clock. And uh, so here's my series of tubes that are useful for transmitting. Uh, we got the 2C39 on the left, which is good for about 100 watts. Next to us, the 3CX3000A7, uh, which will do uh, about 8,000 watts. Problem is, you need to build an amplifier to drive the thing. And on the right, there's a uh, 4CX1000A, which uh, will do 1,500 watts, no problem. Uh, but the, the biggest problem with coming up with these tubes is uh, you can get a tube dirt cheap in the $20 range, but uh, when I tried to buy a socket for the 4CX1000 here, it was like two grand. So, you know, if you don't need to change it, just solder wires to it and you're good. Uh, other tubes that are useful for uh, stuff is uh, this here is a magnetron, uh, which is useful for delivering power in the 2 gigahertz range. Uh, it was originally developed in World War II for uh, use in radar systems. Uh, that, the last slide is a picture of it without the external magnets. Uh, I didn't get a picture of it while I was there, but uh, the set of magnets here is in the Exploratorium in San Francisco and the uh, magnetron would sit in between there. And uh, things have gotten much simpler since we started putting them in microwave ovens. Everything's a nice self-contained unit. So if you wanna come up with a real easy way to get on 2.4 gigahertz with a lot of power, that's the way to do it. Uh, also showing up uh, because of a surplus in UHF television transmitters is uh, klystron tubes. Uh, ever since the digital television transition, uh, analog, uh, analog transmitters are starting to show up on the surplus market. Uh, if, you ask a if you ask any chief engineer of a TV station, chances are he'll give it to you if you haul it out of there. Uh, these are some little klystrons that don't require the external magnets and cavities, uh, but they only put power out in the 20 milliwatt range or so. Uh, other tubes of interest are these guys, the traveling wave tubes. Uh, they're real good because one stage can do 40 to 50 dB of gain depending on the tube. 
So, uh, you know, less than a milliwatt in will get you the full output power of the tube, usually in the 10 to 100 watt range. Uh, it's also very rare to find the traveling wave tube outside of its natural habitat, the traveling wave tube amplifier. So uh, if, if you're in the market for one, definitely buy it in the amplifier form because it'll come with the power supply and it'll take all the guesswork out of it. Uh, another interesting tube is the hydrogen Mazar, which is just like a laser, but with instead of the, uh, the light is microwave. So it's microwave amplification, stimulation through whatever it is. Uh, look it up. Uh, pretty much the only tube that I have heard of that was this type existed here. Uh, the antenna structure that is on the right of the screen there uh, at the Bell Telephone Laboratory Satellite Communication Center in Holmdel, New Jersey at about 1960. Uh, the steerable horn antenna sugar scoop used is for receiving to the right. This was, this was in the 60s when they were playing around with passive reflectors, so they transmit with the antenna on the left and receive it back with the antenna on the right. So, uh, yeah, we're here to talk about moon bouncing, but uh, not that kind of moon. But uh, for whatever reason, I did find a moon bounce room. But uh, no, we're here to talk about this one, Earth's moon, uh, pretty much uh, about 3,400 kilometers in diameter, and uh, it swings between two uh, orbits, a perigee and an apogee, and so it has about 40,000 uh, kilometers worth of swing between the two points, and uh, it comes and goes about every 27 days and change. Uh, the uh, original people that did moon bouncing was shortly after World War II, uh, we did Project Diana, which uh, the, the, the real idea behind Project Diana here was we were in the Cold War with Russia, and we wanted to know what Russian radar signals looked like. So the idea was that these signals were bouncing off the moon somehow, and we were going to be able to receive them. And, so we did this test run with, you know, uh, we basically took a surplus uh, SCR-271 radar set, which was designed by uh, Major Edwin Armstrong, the inventor of FM, by the way, and uh, tried to bounce a signal off the moon. And uh, here's a quick attenuation chart. There's some clever math that goes into it, but basically you can count on the moon to be between 5 and 7% efficient as a reflector. Plus, you have to do the path both ways there. And these, uh, I, I do have the perigee and the apogee, and you'll notice that there's about uh, 2.1 dB gets added, or is that about right? Or two point, it's about 2.2 dB added between perigee and apogee on a moon bounce. And, you know, I just did some common bands here. The, uh, the bands that are in bold and italic here, 2 meter, 70 centimeter, 23 centimeter, those are the ones most commonly used for uh, future reference. So uh, let's take a look at a quick path loss, loss on uh, Project Diana. So our radar set was able to deliver a 8,000 watt carrier and uh, we're about 256 dB on uh, EME and we actually uh, on that radar set, uh, we actually had two antennas side by side, so we got the gain of the radar set up another 3 dB. Uh, pretty much power dub. Each time you double the amount of antennas, your gain goes up 3 dB, so if you're interested, uh, that's why. But uh, uh, look at that uh, estimated signal we've got there, negative 148. Uh, who here is an amateur radio operator? Excellent. Uh, anyone know off the top of their head what the sensitivity is of their receiver? Whereabouts? My, a gentleman said minus 120, and that's that's pretty good. Uh, but uh, that brings them to about there. Gentlemen, that's not acceptable. Oh, So how do we squeeze 28 dB out? Well, there are a number of ways we can do it. Uh, we can basically dip the receiver in liquid nitrogen or liquid hydrogen to make it colder. 
uh, we can decrease the bandwidth or we can try to decrease the uh, noise figure by using better components. So here's a, a block diagram of what the Project Diana receiver looked like and uh, the big key is the receiver bandwidth is 57 hertz. And uh, wow. If you're not careful with a bandwidth that small, uh, you're, you're, the transmitter can easily wander out of the receiver uh, where you're trying to receive. So uh, I didn't want to do a formula, so I made a chart for you, and you can find this on your DEF CON CD, which you should have. So uh, there's three columns here, uh, 70 degrees room temperature, uh, negative 321 is the temperature of liquid nitrogen. Uh, negative 457 is uh, liquid helium. But uh, you'll notice that, uh, you know, a, a room temperature receiver versus one dipped in liquid nitrogen, we get, we get 16 dB more gain out of it. So our, uh, am I doing that right? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't write these numbers down, so I'm just doing it off the top of my head. And, you know, if we can come up with some liquid hydrogen, we get even better than that. Now, I'm sure you're uh, wondering about zero degrees Kelvin. And uh, at zero degrees Kelvin, theoretically, no noise is generated and you have a perfect system. But to date, it has been impossible to make zero degrees. And uh, we, we've gotten really, really close. But I don't know if anyone's dipped a receiver in wherever the close to zero is to see what the results are. But uh, yeah. So let, let's run the numbers again with uh, some stuff here. Uh, negative 174, so we'll assume they ran it at room temperature. And here's the formula to figure out, uh, you know, we can get a decibel rating out of the bandwidth. Uh, it's basically bandwidth, log 10, and then you times that by 10. And uh, we also have to add in the receiver noise figure. So basically, we got, uh, amazingly, we got 1.3 dB to spare. And it was just enough to be detectable. So that was 1946. In 1948, someone said, great, let's bounce signals off the moon as a way to communicate from point A to point B. This comes from the notebook of James H. Trexler. Uh, basically, he theorized that we could shoot a signal off the moon from LA to Washington, DC. And as long as the moon is visible in both places, it'll work. And uh, by golly, it did. Uh, this is a picture that was transmitted via facsimile, uh, via the moon, uh, that was, uh, you know, he theorized that we could do it in 1948, and we didn't get around to doing it till 1960. And uh, so we were able to bounce this signal off the moon, so the Navy was, uh, the Navy did this. This is the picture of a USS Hancock, and it was transmitted between Honolulu, Hawaii, and Washington, D.C. And uh, it, it was pretty brute force, the system the Navy used. It operated somewhere around 400 megahertz, but they had 48-foot uh, dishes with 100,000-watt transmitters. So, yeah, the aliens must love us. First we're sending them pictures of Hitler, then we're sending them pictures of aircraft carriers. <laughs> a little bit later here, in 1962, we uh, went mobile here. This is a picture of the USS Liberty, which was an auxiliary uh, communications relay, sort of like the, an early version of a spy ship. Uh, if you look towards the aft end of it, you'll see a 16-foot dish. And, they had a thousand watt transmitter, which you know is enough because you got a 48 foot dish on the other end. So that could communicate as long as it saw the moon 